Hey guys, and welcome back to the JLX Friends of Benefits podcast with me, your host, Xander Conover. And today I'm joined again by Coach Jack Lenton. Jack and I are going to be discussing some fantastic client questions with protein, carbs, calories, and keto. Enjoy. Good afternoon, Jack. Thank you very much for diving in onto the show once again. So let's uh, start with where we usually start. Have you been doing anything this week that you're excited about, or any projects you've got on the go that you'd like to tell us a little bit about before we start? So last week was project specific, right? We were talking about the Lift Our Health Workers guide that's now over and done with. This week, it wouldn't be project specific, but as I'm sat here in front of a big old window and looking out of it, I am weirdly excited about the fact that it's now rainy and cold right where I am compared to the last few weeks. (laughs) Because I feel like right now, this is where like the rubber hits the road. You know, when we're in lockdown and it's dead nice outside, super sunny, super hot, it's more than easy to get outside. And at the end of my road is the beach and the overcliff and a gorgeous part of, you know, England. And so (laughs) why would I not want to get out in that? But when it's like this, I feel like now is the time to really earn credibility with yourself, you know, and get into those habits and tools and tactics that we always talk about setting up in a proper way. I feel like as with every behavior, the actual juice is in the journey of it, right? And that comes part and parcel of whether it's hot and beautiful or rainy. And as I said, I think that's where you you get that credibility with yourself because you know that you're going to go and execute and still get out and get your steps in and still do what you said you're going to do, regardless of how the outside weather's looking in. It's me that decides it. And it's me that, you know, actions that without just acting based on what the external weather is doing. I agree. I think this is a time and you'll agree that motivation doesn't count for anything because, Mm -hmm. you know, we've been in lockdown now for a long period of time and people are starting to get a bit wary. People are starting to kind of dip off a little bit now. Um, but yeah. this is the time where those solid habits and those solid um, expectations of ourselves have to come through and we have to, to push through with those regardless of whether we feel like it or not, right? Yeah, and it's a time to see it as like, I, inherently, I don't wake up and think, yes, it's raining. But if I tell myself I'm going to be excited about it, if I tell myself that's a good thing, if I tell myself this is something I'm going to give myself credibility for and feel good about, then it fosters more of that, right? And it's almost tricking your subconscious into feeling that way because it's not going to happen by magic when it's as gray as it is no i agree what about you i have been on the same kind of wavelength as last week actually i've been digging into some more books i've kind of got uh in this time i thought you know usually i read and it's inside i obviously read before i go to bed as part of my nightly routine um but i've been trying to kind of share that outside a bit more so maybe not a project as such but i know last time we spoke about me trying to increase the amount of gratitude practice i was doing and one thing i hadn't yet made use of was the weather so a bit like you talking about the weather i used to just sit in here and read and i just think i could do this all winter in england and most of summer to be fair because it's never nice enough to go outside and i was doing my gratitude practice one day and i just thought the one thing I haven't put on there yet is how damn nice this country is at the moment. And the other thing I haven't done yet is go and make use of it. Yeah. So for me, it was really a case of putting two and two together and then going out there and indulging myself in it whilst doing something I love to do. So it's been a really nice week in that respect. It's been very busy, but at the same time, having some downtime to go and do those things that really, one, I have a greater appreciation for now, thanks to the practices I've been putting into place. But mm-hmm. two, actually just being able to sit there and kind of take something in rather than be like, oh, we're in lockdown or being like, oh, it's so hot out here. I'm like, this is brilliant. Like, again, like yourself there the other day uh, when it, I think it was the first day it rained um, Monday or Tuesday, I literally went for a walk in the rain and just left my hood down. because I was like, this is lovely. And a little, a little bit like you, realistically, it wasn't that lovely. No. You know what? Smile in the rain. It's all good. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's an experience. It's something else to experience. And what does feel good after a walk in the rain is getting home into the warm, getting changed into warm clothes, having a shower. And you get that feeling of not only 
the nice feels in terms of physically but also obviously that mental and emotional pat on the back of like I still went and did what I said I was going to do I didn't back out just because of some external circumstance I feel like we should do an entire podcast on perspective you know I agree I agree I was just actually thinking before we move on to the the questions do you still have a cold shower yeah <laughs> yeah and that, that, that's another thing that is not too pleasant if you <laughs> yeah, when you're there you know staring at the tap thinking about turning it for the last few minutes of your shower it's it's never something that is inherently great to like to feel but when you feel that pull of like i don't want to do it that's my signal for like go deeper do it yeah yeah because you know that again you've said you're going to do it and if i was to hop out of that shower without doing it i'd be like oh, you backed out there man you mm. let yourself down yeah i i must admit i do the same it's like you grab the shower head and it's just like here it goes yeah <laughs> <laughs> let out a little squeal and hope for the best and mate, it never gets easier like you, <laughs> you learn breathing techniques you breathe into it you calm down after I, I tend to find it's about like 20 30 breaths i start to get to a stage where i'm like not just you know, <laughs> hyperventilating with it but uh, like still that initial turn never gets any easier and it's no. a little win it's just like a little easy thing that i think is, is such a nice way to build a bit of resilience mm. and yeah tick a little box in your day fantastic so let's get stuck in shall we so questions for this week we're going on nutrition based and these are mostly based from clients over the past week which i think is really exciting yeah. it's good to get them involved and the first one is calories versus macros now a question that i got on monday was Xander, should I hit my calories or should I hit my macros? And the basics of the question were that the protein levels are really, really down. And she was saying that I could hit them, but it means I'm going to go over on my calories by two to 300. What do I do? Protein in itself is a bit of a special case because generally, of course, we would say hitting total calories is the most important thing. That is the lead domino that you need to knock down before you start thinking about things like specific macros fiber intake messing around with you know water intake carb timing all that sort of stuff comes secondary to to nailing the calories um with protein though specifically because she said that i think protein is unique in that i have seen protein overfeeding studies where subjects don't tend to gain more body fat from overfeeding protein if those surplus calories are purely coming from protein that is so not that someone's just smashing 5,000 calories a day and it's a, it's a high protein diet. You know, these were very controlled studies where, you know, one group would eat a set amount, the other group would eat the same set amount plus upwards of 400 calories extra from protein. And even that group who are having technically 400 calories more did not gain significantly more body fat. Now, if that 400 calories was coming from pure fats, they would, that would be a decent surplus, right? But protein, of course, does act differently. And this is always one big thing that throws up a question mark in my head when people get really overly simplistic about it and they say that, you know, calories only, bro. Just calories matter, like nothing else. It's just not the case because we know that macros perform differently and protein definitely being a special case in that. So, and as well with clients, if clients ever go over on protein, I'd never even say anything about it generally. If clients are 10, 20, 30 grams over on protein, because I know it's not going to have a big physiological difference, the only thing I might ask them is, hey, do you want to raise protein? Because do you prefer having a higher target? So they don't feel like they're um, kind of missing the mark every week, you know, and not actually getting to their goals because that can be demotivating. So for protein specifically, I think it's okay to be over. Um, but generally, we always would like to have some happy mediums, some happy ranges. And so when we talk about having, say, like a calorie number, what we tend to do with clients is have something like a calorie target, but then also have a protein minimum within that. Because, again, we know protein is pretty unique. We can kind of be a bit interchangeable with like carb and fat calories. You know, if you get an extra 100 calories from carbs or fat or vice versa, is it really going to matter? probably not but again protein's unique we can't build muscle purely with carbs and fats 
right? We need protein in there to build those building blocks of our muscle protein. So um, I think having some sort of protein minimum and saying, look, we want to shoot for at least this, and then you can be flexible with the carbs and fats and come around your kind of calorie target is kind of the minimum I'd like to go for most clients because clients come to us with a physique based goal, right? So that is also something to definitely bear in mind. What is your goal with it? And if you have goals around maintaining muscle mass or building muscle mass and, you know, carving up your body in the way you want it to look, then you should have a good concern around a minimum protein intake, in my opinion. Fantastic. So shifting the question on another point, if they were, for example, vegan, how would that plan out for you if you had, say, that protein source? You obviously have protein shakes. All our clients, I think we would advise, especially to start off with, with hitting that minimum goal you discussed there, because it's an easy way to do it. It's not a, a challenge as such. It's kind of a helpful stool, a step up stool to, to get there. But if mm -hmm. they were vegan or are vegan, rather, what would you recommend in that sense? In the sense of total protein intake? Yeah, so hitting that higher protein intake, because obviously with that, it's likely that we're going to get more carbs and more fats. Do you have any kind of suggestion of what you would kind of recommend there? Yeah, so the, the first thing to acknowledge with protein intake is that there are ranges to have. You know, there's not, we don't yet know in the scientific literature, like one protein intake that is perfect, right? Different studies come out with different amounts and different amounts find different things in terms of conclusions. So we can't say that there's a set amount that's perfect to have, whether you're vegan or not. So if someone's struggling to get enough protein in as a vegan, and they know that they're going to get a lot of carbs and fats as kind of secondary protein sources through just what they eat, we may just aim for a bit of a lower number. Because again, there are scientific studies saying that we can hit probably somewhere around 1.6 to 1.8 grams per kilogram and still be fine for muscle mass. Like we'll still protect our muscle mass. Now, there are also studies saying that if you take that higher, you know, 2.2 to 2.6, there's even one study that went to 3.1 grams per kilogram and showed better muscle gain results. You know, they do come out with better outcomes. And I'd explain this to a client and say, look, in an ideal world, this is where we'd be up to if you're really wanting to eke out every last gram of muscle growth. But if for whatever reason, you know, you're wanting to keep calories lower and total protein lower, be my guest. You know, this is kind of the lowest I would, I would shoot for. And that being somewhere around that 1.6 to 1.8 grams per kilogram. Now, if someone was like, look, I'm on board. I want to gain absolutely as much as I possibly can. I don't care what that total protein intake is then actually when you're vegan, you may even want to think about taking things a bit higher than what standard you know, animal product eating uh, protein intake would be because a lot of vegan proteins are lower in amino acid variation and quality. So they just contain less amino acids, certainly less of the key amino acid leucine, which is the key trigger for muscle protein synthesis. And so if we aren't getting as much of that kind of per gram of product, per gram of protein, if you will, sometimes you want to overshoot the total amount of protein that you have. So in, again, scientific studies that look at this, they may see that a, a full serving of animal-based protein from something like whey protein or chicken might be somewhere around 35 grams of protein. Whereas for like a pea protein, you might need like 50 grams, 55 grams to get that same amount of the amino acid leucine. So you might want to overshoot it, but then you're going to have to be very careful and conscientious in terms of where those protein sources are coming from, probably using, like you say, things like a, a vegan protein powder um, and other kind of lean vegan protein sources. Um, and that would be, you know, the only way that you're going to be able to do that without having a hundred grams of fiber in a day and 600 grams of carbs. Cause you're eating just like lentils and rice and beans all the time. Fantastic. And I think just to, to add on what you said there, the, the recommendation would certainly be when it comes to uh, vegan protein shakes to, to get a blend um, mm. to make sure you don't just have one pure source. I remember, uh, I think it was in January this year, a study came out comparing if you got absolute protein from vegan sources and absolute protein from whey and animal sources the way an animal source is still trumped it massively. And it was a really, really thorough study. Um, it's fantastic to, to kind of get that out again, because of course there is still kind of debates coming around where if we can match protein via vegan sources and we can match protein via 
uh, well, that to the animal sources, surely that's the same. But as you just said, it, it just isn't because the, the amino acid profiles of these different sources are different. I mean, that's something we have to accept. And that's why possibly it is a more beneficial thing to have that mixture of uh, lens into a vegan protein powder rather than just having, say, pea or having um, rice, for example. Yeah, yeah. So that's also to do with the not just the amount of amino acids, but the spectrum of them as well, isn't it? Yeah. You know, we can create complete proteins by combining two different vegan protein sources. And again, this is, you know, going back to kind of the start of this, this is stuff to think about after you've taken care of like total calories, total macros, yeah. you know, all these types of things. And these are things that if you really want to be optimal, you should be caring about. Sometimes you get people, you know, coming and asking questions about things like that. And you say, well, you know, where are your calories at? What are your goals at the moment? And they can't even answer like basic starter questions like that. Yeah. And really don't get bogged down in, in the minutia if that's the case take care of the big stuff first and then come to this sort of thing afterwards yeah it's putting the cart before the horse isn't it in that in that respect it's you know you need that you need the, the principles the big domino as you said first and then after that we can we can function on the other parts but if you don't get that first one right then focusing on everything beyond that does kind of let you down yeah um while you mentioned that, just in the last bit, for those who don't quite understand, could you just describe, you mentioned about um, full amino acids. Um, for those who maybe don't know what that is, could you just briefly discuss that? So what a full amino acid kind of protein would be? Yeah. Yeah, so proteins are made up of amino acids. They are often called the quote-unquote building blocks of proteins. And our body likes to get a broad spectrum of these so we have essential and non-essential amino acids and when we're building muscle it's best to eat food sources that have a, a nice full broad spectrum of all those different amino acids all animal products have that already so if you're getting egg whites whey isolate chicken beef pork fish whatever it is that is always pretty much going to contain a full amino acid spectrum and a good amount of the key amino acid leucine specifically However, the plant-based proteins are lacking some of those amino acids. So maybe they're lacking, you know, five to 10 different amino acids that an animal protein source would have. And there may be another type of vegan protein that has those five to 10 that the other one is lacking. So by combining those two, you create yourself a full protein by eating those two together at the same time. The most commonly kind of touted example of this that creates a full protein is legumes and rice protein so the classic combination of like beans and rice that creates a full protein for vegans spot on thank you very much so speaking of beans and legumes and obviously moving into the um, sources of macronutrients that vegans would get let's touch a little bit on carbohydrates now so another question that i received this week is why are carbohydrates so great? And this wasn't a rhetorical question. <laughs> um, but they basically wanted to know, you know, we set carbohydrate much higher than fat proportionately of, carb of total calories. You know, why do we do that? And, you know, you know I will let you take this um, and uh, I'll chip in if, if, if I feel need to. Okay, so there's... I feel like this is the sort of subject that people can be on like one camp or the other in, in terms of like team <laughs> carb or team fat quite hard. And I'm genuinely not asked either way. I want to look at what the scientific data says. I want to look at the results I've seen with clients and with myself, and I want to get the best outcomes for them. I'm, I'm genuinely, if someone showed fantastic evidence that high fat was better and i started seeing way better results in all my clients than i would turn on a sixpence as they say and start giving everyone high fat because if that's what works that's what works but in the data currently we see that generally you know uh having a percentage of somewhere around maybe 15 to 30 or 20 to 35 percent of your total calorie intake from fat is enough that's sufficient to cover all the baseline needs that you have in your body for fat. So in terms of things like producing hormones, lubricating your joints, making sure that your brain's functioning well, all of these things that are just like 
good baseline things for our health, right? When it then comes to gaining muscle mass above and beyond that, or just having any sort of kind of physique-based goals, fat doesn't have a particularly positive impact when we take it above that amount. So don't get me wrong, we definitely need that minimum amount. We need to have a minimum amount of essential fatty acids. But above and beyond that, you have to ask what purpose is that particularly serving? Generally, a lot of our clients have, again, physique-based goals. Well, all of them do, in fact. You know, they may have secondary goals in terms of strength, but people come to us because they want to change their bodies, right? And so something that's going to help you to look better is having a good amount of carb storage in your muscles, what we call muscle glycogen, that helps your muscles to look fuller and look better. It's almost like filling up a, a pillowcase, you know, with more pillow the more kind of stuffed <laughs> more <duck> down. <laughs> <laughs> the more stuffed it looks the more full that muscle is going to be and that's why sometimes we for example wake up and we might say we're looking flat or maybe we've done a lot of cardio and we say we're looking depleted you know or bodybuilders that have been cutting carbs really heavily into a show say oh, i'm flat at the moment it's because of a lack of carbs in the muscles so you know adding carbs in is going to help how they look for one adding more carbs in is then going to massively help gym performance and this is a, a huge one that I am, I'm yet to have a different experience to exactly this with a client thus far. And you can, you can tell me if you have personally with, with clients that I don't know about in the clients will come to us sometimes and say, Oh, I do high fat because it's better for me, but you know, I'm, I'm not actually getting on with my results and I don't really like where I'm at and stuff. And we might say, okay, well let's try a lower fat, higher carb approach. And within a couple of weeks, they're like, my energy is great. My gym performance has gone up. I'm recovering. I've got like energy in my brain every day and I actually feel good. And that's because they've got those carbs. They've got that source of energy. So when we start seeing things like gym performance and training going up in turn, of course, that's going to come around as a secondary factor and massively improve their physique. Cause if they're training better in the long term and they're doing more volume in the gym and their strengths going up, that's going to lead to muscle growth with it as well. So that's another reason to go kind of more, more carb based. It's also, undeniable and whether this is right or wrong could certainly be argued in terms of you know the obesity literature and everything that our current climate our current society is pretty carb based and so it's all well and good to say to someone eat zero carbs go keto and only have fats and very little protein um, but actually every time they then have a meal with their partner chances are their partner's not going to enjoy eating you know coconut oil fried grass-fed beef and some sort of mct oil fake dessert that you've created from your keto recipe book (laughs) (laughs) and in terms of then how society works with family and friends and stuff as well you know if you go to a family event and there's a food spread there (laughs) that's not going to be a keto (laughs) spread and so if you're constantly falling off of this diet that's supposed to be keto that's also then very ineffective. And just on that note of keto as well, being ketogenic is a very specific physiological diet. You have to have your ketones above a certain level of millimole. It's not, I eat mostly high fat, but also kind of still eat some carbs and my protein's really high. That's not going to put you in a state of ketosis. And if you are in a true state of ketosis, you'll be constantly kicking yourself out of that when you overeat protein or overeat carbs. And that's just obviously terrible in terms of longevity and long-term progress when it comes to that diet. I totally agree. I think looking at the literature on ketogenics uh, diets and also ketosis in itself, it's something that I would only recommend someone did if they were going to commit to it long-term because it's not a, it's not what I would call a diet. It's a genuine lifestyle. You know, it's something that as you rightly point out there, you, you cannot go, to a party with your friends and family, you know, and expect them to have things that, that will fit your diet, unless you're going to go to the meat section only and just hammer that, uh, trying to avoid everything else. Because, you know, but that mate, in itself... Mate, even then, you're going to go over on protein. A lot this people, is it. What a lot of people forget about keto is that it's also low protein, because if you have too much protein, it's going to get converted into uh, glucose, and then it's going to be used up as carbs. Precisely. And I think actually that's the the point I was going to come on to is that the mistake people make in this is that they see it as a quick fix. Oh, if I remove carbohydrate, I'm good. 
But actually, as you rightly allude to uh, in, the, in the bit you said a minute ago, it's not a case of just removing carbohydrate. You know, there is a lot of things that you have to physiologically get right for this mm-hmm. to work. And the frustrating thing for me is that some people will start this diet and go, well, I feel much better than I did before. And I think you're, you might be right there. You probably do feel maybe better than you did before. But my first point would be, how long are you going to maintain that for? My second point would be, what were you doing before? Because a lot of people eat a ton of shit and then they go, I need to clean myself up because this is ridiculous. Then they go hammer to the other end of the spectrum. But in doing that, they've not actually explored what's in the middle of that, which Mm -hmm. fundamentally is probably where they feel even better than they did at either side. But people deal in absolutes, unfortunately. And uh, that's where I think trial and error is is certainly important but also a really good amount of judgment which i think people lack when they go headfirst into that kind of diet yeah yeah being willing to actually be brutally honest with yourself and say why does this work like you say is it the fact that before i was just stuffing my face with anything and everything and now it's not the fact that i've gone keto it's the fact that i've started eating whole foods i've started eating more veggies and more greens and most of my fats are really good quality fat sources and i'm actually you know not probably enjoying that food all too much i'm not really Mm. someone personally who would enjoy like you know butter fried meat all day every day and stuff and a lot of other keto type foods so maybe then you don't eat as much of it whereas it's really easy to tear through carrot cake which (laughs) is really carby and really fatty right so there's a whole different amount of reasons why it, why it may or may not work and the one final caveat actually to add to this because some people might be screaming at their podcast app right now <laughs> is that it does work in very certain circumstances such as epilepsy and potentially cancer those are two areas that have been researched i won't say well researched because it's not yet you know completely conclusive but if i was to suddenly develop either epilepsy or cancer tomorrow, touch wood, I would 100% go keto. Yeah, I think that's a, an interesting point. I think the in a situation, not to dive down that uh, rabbit hole too much, but in that situation, I think anything that you can do that might help. Um, but of course, with that, it's important that you obviously get advice from your medical professional and they'll probably be able to tell you a certain amount but without then diving down the rabbit hole of medical professions and their nutritional practices, yeah. I think it's, um, it's important again, to do your own research. You know, I can't encourage you enough to ask questions to people who have respectable uh, amounts of knowledge, not necessarily are in a respectable place just because you have doctor in front of your name doesn't make you a professional at um, all areas of um, nutrition and diet unless you have rd of course um but equally these guys will be able to help you out a certain way but what might be beneficial for you is to ask them where you can find out more information and then hopefully they'll be able to point you somewhat in that direction yeah and i think really importantly if not like because for some people ignorance is bliss and it's fine that that works for them and that's cool but if you're that person where you don't have to know why it works or how it works you just want to do it that's fine, but shut up about it. <laughs> Don't go around telling all your mates that this is the best diet ever because of X, Y, Z, because you read this thing in Cosmo, because women's health said this, because, you know, ketoheads.com told you this, like you have to accept the fact that this is working for me. I'm not hundred percent sure why, but it is working. And then you have to be honest when people ask you about that and say, you know, this is what I'm trialing. This is what I'm doing. I don't fully know the science behind it or why, but you know, here's just the the kind of brutal facts of what I'm doing in terms of a top line of this. Don't then claim that you know exactly why it's working, the science behind it, quote unquote, what they're saying now is keto's great because of X, Y, Z, you know, like don't, don't flex in front as if you know what's going on unless you've done quality prior research and that's fine. There's no like better or worse. There's no value judgment on that if you haven't properly dived into it, just be brutally honest about that fact and don't try and claim that it's the best thing since sliced bread. 
I agree. Just to add to that, I think time is a thing as well. Like you have to give these things time because mm -hmm. people either feel great for the first week and then two weeks later you'll speak to them and like, this is terrible. Like I can't do this anymore. Yeah. Or they'll feel absolutely terrible in the first week. And you're like, you know, we'll give it some time. Just, just not jump off the wagon just yet. And then after a couple of weeks, they feel great. So I think it can go either way with that, can't it? And, and again, if you have that knowledge, like you say, even if you don't give it time because Staying to something for staying to something for one week or one day is not going to be enough to to have a really profound effect on anything, no. unless potentially placebo. In which case, you want to see that out before you go shouting about it, even if you do have the knowledge to do so, because you could potentially mislead a bunch of people in that time, and then you look like an idiot when in three weeks time you're like, "Nah, carbs are life." <laughs> yeah, which which happens a lot of people bouncing around different diets, you know they'll tell you it's the best thing ever. And then the next week they're on something else and it's just a, a slight variation of that or whatever. And actually often the big underlying thing is total calories, isn't it? And then stickability long-term. So in terms of kind of summing that up and coming back around to the, the top end of that, if you want your carbs to be somewhere between 15 to 30% say of your total intake, I also tend to not take carbs below a complete bottom line, sorry, fats below a bottom line of like, 40 grams or so because that's where you may start getting too low and you're not getting the essential fatty acids that you need so as long as your 15 to 30 to percent is above that kind of 40 gram minimum then from there you're probably good to go if you like to have a bit of a higher fat intake so you can enjoy some chocolate in the evenings you can fit in some higher fat meats whatever it is do that that's cool fill in the rest of your calories with carbs and just understand that that's always going to be a trade-off in terms of if you have higher fat you're then going to have to have slightly lower carbs in order to still come within your total calorie target. So I think that takes us perfectly on to the next question then. So why might carbs not be so good? So another question I've had, it was actually last week, not this week, but the question was, what happens if I have too many carbohydrates? And I think the honest answer to that is, not a lot would go badly wrong. You know, people think that <laughs> diabetes is caused by too many carbohydrates, but that myth's definitely been dispelled now. Well, but you what, think so. <laughs> what could uh, what could be a problem with with a high carb diet? What could be a problem is certainly just overeating through too many carbs, and this is the big problem with sugar. It's not that it, like sugar itself is inherently the devil, but it tastes really damn good, especially when combined with fats, and especially especially when combined with fats and salt. So you think of all the types of foods that people like to eat regularly and overeat. They tend to contain sugar, salt and fat or sugar and fat if they're sweet. And so the problem with that is it causing you to go over your calories, right? And eat too many calories from that. So if you're someone, for example, that, you know, like when I'm dieting, if I'm on low calorie and I'm really getting lean, I can't have granola in the gaff. Like me, I, I can't do it with control. And I know that I will overeat on my calories. And so I don't buy it. Right. So in those scenarios, you know, you can have over due to carbs being particularly tasty as the first person put it, you know, carbs are great. And so they're easy to you know, eat a lot of. Um, and then that also ties into, I guess, the second scenario when they're not so ideal, which is if you actually have to diet and get really low, you know, you do want to get to either a particularly low level of body fat or because of your metabolism, calories have to get relatively low, or because of either your preferences and lifestyle, you don't want to do a lot of cardio, or you don't do a lot of kind of general energy expenditure in the day, you probably can't have a super high carb intake. You know, I think the, the late Charles Poliquin, who has debatable information, let's say, on certain topics here and there, but something he used to say about carbs is you should earn your carbs, right? And there's an element of truth to that. I don't mean that in like a, a moral standpoint or like, a you know, I know the self-worth crew would absolutely slate me for saying that. I'm not talking about like a sense of like you deserve carbs or not. What he meant is in the sense of like, if your energy expenditure is high, if you're training a lot, sure, you can probably eat a lot of carbs. If you're sedentary all day and you don't have a lot of expenditure, you probably can't eat that many. And actually you have to be realistic about the fact of where your total calorie intake is going to sit. And if you're trying to get lean, carbs may have to get low. Because again, if we've got that kind of bottom line of 
uh, fats where we don't want it to get particularly low you know maybe don't want it under say that 40 gram kind of mark so we're getting enough essential fatty acids then you're gonna have to pull from carbs because you sure as hell don't want to be pulling from protein when you're getting lean if you want to maintain your muscle mass and it has to be again an honest objective look at the situation because with the flexible dieting movement with the kind of a lot of the natural bodybuilding movement as well i would say a lot of these people can get to really high carb intakes and we see the kind of genetic elite on instagram the one percent who can have 800 grams of carbs in their off season and then they get lean on 400 grams of carbs and people then kind of get it in their heads that like oh well i should be able to diet on high carbs as well well look if you're not as lean as you want to be and you want to get leaner then either your calories are going to have to get lower or your expenditure is going to have to get higher and that's probably going to have to be pulled from carbs so don't kind of pull the wool over your own eyes and think that you have to be eating high carb high carb is always firstly going to be proportionate to what your total calorie intake is and so secondly if that calorie intake starts to get low carbs may also have to just get low as part and parcel of that diet phase as well yeah i think as well with the earn your carbs point if you look at how people diet in such a ballistic manner especially those who maybe have overeaten for a long period of time and then they decide that enough's enough i'm just going to diet and we've all been there right where we just you know i know from when i first dieted for the very first time i didn't really know exactly the mechanisms for what to do i just know i needed to eat some less um and so you know you go into that deficit and you almost lose out on a big amount of calories because you basically slump your metabolism straight down to where you ever you put yourself to right you know if you're someone who naturally could walk around at 4000 calories and then you cut off a great amount of that and you try to maintain whatever you do, you know, you're going to feel lethargic. You might not feel as energetic and get as much out of your gym performance. And then you're wondering, well, hang on a minute. I lost loads of weight to start with. I'm not losing any now. You know, the comment to that is, you know, and I say this to clients that come and say, oh, you know, I eat 1200 calories, but I'm not losing weight. And then you kind of look at them and think, well, you know, where do you go from here? You know, if, if that's what you want to do, where do you go from here? Because we're, we're not going to really realistically take you down to 900 calories, you know, but in that it's that it you know what i take from that you know earn your carbs is be sensible with how you make those cuts you know if you've got a coach who knows what they're doing then obviously trust them and go with what they're saying you know the recommendations they're giving you to to, to do that but don't just cut things in half and, and hope for the best there because yeah. i feel like that is what then puts you in that situation where you know you your weight loss stalls and then it's loads of cardio that you're going to need and then it's kind of a long road back to get you to where you were. So, you know, take that starting point that you've either earned by going through a good um, gaining phase throughout the, the winter or, or whenever you've done it over a couple of years, take that, sit with it for a couple of weeks and then gently migrate yourself in. Um, obviously different situations will call for different things. If you've put on a load of fat, then obviously you can mini cut, et cetera. And that could be a, a good option. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly I wouldn't look to just slam yourself down um, because that you know all those carbs you burn by doing the things you've said you've kind of thrown away yeah i think it's it's worth just underscoring with that that like it's not the norm to be say doing no cardio dieting on really high carbs and like still getting shredded still getting super lean yeah we definitely see people like that and whether that's genetic predisposition whether that's the fact they have high levels of muscle mass or you know, whatever that is, I mean, a lot of it on Instagram is also <laughs> stimulants, drugs, enhancements, and things that we just can't account for and can't fully know what everyone's doing. Yeah. But like in that situation, don't feel like you're, there's no right or wrong. You, you don't even really have like a quote unquote good or bad metabolism. Just deal with the facts of what it is that you're looking at in front of you. And if, you know, you need to get leaner, you need to cut calories, be realistic about how much more cardio you need to do or what cuts you need to make to calories. And try not to place value judgments on that. Try not to, you know, kind of talk yourself out of the game because you feel like things, quote unquote, should be different to how they are. The fact is they're not. And so deal with exactly what it is you have in front of you and take whatever that best next step is for you. I've seen a big movement as well lately with a lot of lifters, like really slamming cardio and really not, you know, obviously like not everyone enjoys it. It's not the most fun thing for a lot of people. But that can be, I think a lot of that is also down to like cardio modality and how people do it. You know, if you just slog yourself away on a treadmill post-workout, 
you're probably not going to enjoy it. But, you know, what if you burned that same number of calories going out and having a kick about playing football with your mates yeah. or like I've taken to road cycling lately and I absolutely love it. It's become like a new thing that I'm really into. It's a great way to burn a lot of calories. If anything, I'm burning too much at the moment <laughs> and I'm having to eat a load back because of that, because I really enjoy it and I like going far. And so find ways that you enjoy it, find ways that you can do it. It's not the devil. It's not something that you have to hate just because you're a lifter. And actually it may allow you to eat more carbs in turn because you're doing more expensive. I think we're good to go. I feel like we've covered a, a decent amount of ground. I would say ask follow-up questions because there's always nuances with this. Yes. There's never just a set right answer. You'll notice that I often talk about generalities. I talk about ranges. I talk about these circumstances versus these circumstances. Anyone who gives you like a hard and fast rule on something is either lying or they're trying to sell you something. So if you've got personal questions in this that you're thinking, but what about my situation X, Y, Z, there will be some sort of, you know, subtle variation of these answers for you. Feel free to reach out, feel free to ask whether that's through DM, through email, through the comments of this once it's up on YouTube. And yeah, don't be afraid to get personal with your situation because it has to be personalized to you in every scenario. Spot on. Thank you very much. Thanks again for joining us for episode two of the JLX Friends with Benefits podcast. We're going to be adding in a Q&A to the podcast in a few weeks time. And to do that, we're going to need some questions from you guys. So do go over to our team Instagram page at JLX Coaching on Instagram, of course, and click the link in the bio and it will take you to a quick Google form where you can fill in uh, any of the questions you've got and we will get to those in the podcast to come. As for coaching, you can also check the link in our Instagram bio for that or go to the website, which is at the moment jacklenton.com and you will see the links to coaching there. Until next week, have a great one.